Uh, please welcome Dr. Ray. Well, I'm sort of going to give this in two parts. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, speaking to this audience, uh, uh, it's the first part is going to be rather ridiculous because it's does it, uh, EMF problems exist, and then the second part, how do we treat it? And uh, you know, we started doing this uh, probably in the late 70s, and we had uh, uh, every once in a while we'd have a patient come in and say they were sensitive to electricity, and of course that stimulates our interest, and so we had to do something about it. At that time, I was a heart surgeon and knew the value of electricity because I'd shocked uh, a few thousand hearts back to life and it did seem to work in most of them. And so the question is, can we always channel EMF for the good rather than the adverse? And so that's what we've tried to do uh, over the years. And it's a growing problem. And it's becoming the major problem next to the uh, chemical problem. And I'm not so sure it's not going to exceed it uh, eventually. Uh, if we don't seem to get a handle on it, you know. So uh, 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 let's go ahead and examine it a little bit. Now, some of the signs or symptoms, of course, are uh, intolerance to transformers and computers and wireless and, and uh, electrical outlets and TV and Wi-Fi, even the sun and power lines. And so uh, uh, it's something that's uh, total environmental load is what we've got to look for. Now it is, uh, uh, EMF sensitivity is a result in many cases of uh, environmental overload of other kinds like chemicals, foods, molds, and so on. And then the second uh, type is uh, one of uh, just EMF sensitivity, that somehow we've accessed uh, the electrical uh, system of the body and managed to foul it up in some way or another. The, the uh, so um, let's just see what uh, we have. The smart meters are now the problem of the day, and electrical companies are trying to force uh, people to uh, have one of those meters on their houses and on buildings. And we've seen a lot of people made sick from this. Uh, I had one example of a person just uh, he and his uh, uh, wife and daughter came back from Europe in the mid. They walked in the house and they sensed something was wrong and they all got nausea, vomiting, fatigue, headaches. And uh, he, interestingly, was an electrical engineer. And so he went rooting around and found out that uh, the electrical company, without his permission, had stored the, or had put the smart meter right outside his bedroom, uh, bedroom window. And uh, uh, so he uh, had uh, a little fighting to do, which they said he had to have it. It was the law, however, it turns out it's not the law, at least in uh, Texas. Uh, now, it may be in some states, but I'm not aware of it yet, but there are all kind of hearings going on because of the Wi-Fi uh, smart meters, you know, and the like. Now, um, often, well, I'll go on the first part, often it's the uh, electrical sensitivity is uh, preceded by the chemical problem. And we have a whole group of patients now who were very chemically sensitive and who were electrically sensitive also. And as we got them better from their uh, chemical sensitivity, the electrical sensitivity went away. And uh, so I suspect that somehow the chemicals were perturbing the, uh, uh, disturbing the uh, different uh, areas in the uh, body uh, and interfering with the uh, proper electrical waves. So it's something you should keep uh, in uh, mind all the time when you're dealing with this because the other problem is, is I've seen some places that were uh, remediated and didn't take the chemical problem into consideration and made the chemical problem worse and therefore were unsuccessful at uh, treating the home uh, properly. Uh, we used our own uh, proof uh, in the 80s uh, for this because the big skepticism at the time uh, was, well, this is ridiculous. This, uh, there's no plausible reason and it just doesn't exist. So uh, what we did is we took 100 uh, patients uh, who uh, complained of electrical sensitivity. And uh, so we uh, divided them and uh, 
Then we went out and got some uh, college students and, and uh, various fellow travelers and, and uh, divided them for our control group. And uh, this was the first phase. And uh, we put the patients in a chemically uh, less polluted environment. And, uh, you know, we had things like uh, crude uh, screening of the uh, uh, TV, which we found if you got it at least eight feet off the floor, uh, most of the waves uh, don't uh, hit people, and we use that uh, also as our uh, areas, and the same here. All these are all crude uh, TV computers of, of yesteryear, I guess you'd say. Um, the monitoring devices were used in an effort to ensure that extraneous EMF would not come in. We had a screen room, and the patients were placed in a controlled environment, uh, less polluted, uh, at the time, and then we used the uh, frequency generator of um, where the range was uh, one tenth to five uh, megahertz, just one that you can turn to different frequencies and see if that will uh, trigger the patient. And then we had five placebo challenges uh, on each of these patients. And uh, uh, the room was screened as best as possible uh, using copper wire and aluminum. And uh, what we did is uh, a lot of these, I don't doubt that most of these patients were electrically sensitive, but uh, their reactions were so severe that they would spill over into the placebos. But we found 25 patients uh, that did not react to any of the placebos. And so we took that group and uh, we, we also compared it with uh, healthy volunteers. All these were double blind challenges. Interestingly, none of the None of the uh, uh, volunteers reacted to any challenge or any placebo. So we were actually surprised because usually in your control group you have some. 69% um, of the EMF sensitive patients had positive signs and symptoms. You could observe the changes like in pulse, blood pressure, respiration, or whatever they had. And uh, also uh, we used the autonomic nervous system measurement through the eyes. Um, Professor Ishikawa at the Kitasato Youth of Percy in Japan invented this and was part of our, his, his residents were part of our team. And so the pupil graph uh, certainly did uh, change with this. This is just an example of the pupil graph. And uh, then uh, we took these uh, patients uh, in the fourth phase. There were 16 EMF patients uh, who had not reacted to the placebo, but did react to the active challenge. And uh, we re-challenged them again. And I must say I'm grateful to these patients for having to go through all this, what I call somewhat scientific nonsense to prove cause and effect. But there was no question in our mind that uh, these people were clearly electrically sensitive. And so that got us uh, uh, going on all these things. And um, the conclusion were there's strong evidence that electromagnetic field sensitivity exists. And uh, we've now done over 1,500 patients uh, uh, with uh, electromagnetic sensitivity and is skyrocketing now. And uh, um, almost most of the patients have somewhat uh, electrical sensitivity, even though that's not their main complaint. They may have mold sensitivity, or they may have food or, or uh, uh, chemical or all three, and uh, most of them are medication sensitive. But uh, the, the bad electromagnetics uh, are skyrocketing that. Seems to be a high correlation between uh, electrical sensitivity and metal sensitivity, and that's something that we hadn't been aware of. and. Uh, it, it was quite interesting. We started dissecting this out. 85% were sensitive to zinc. So that means if they were uh, taking minerals, uh, they may be sensitive to it, or if they were working around zinc, or if they had too too high of, uh, of it in their food, they would do it. The same with copper and chrome and cobalt. And uh, then uh, we started looking into other things. However, uh, stainless steel and titanium and its alloys and uh, molybdenum, manganese, magnesium, 
and nickel in about 200 patients. You can do mineral analysis of these people now, and most important, you can do provocation, uh, injection of the uh, different dilutions of the minerals, and you can trigger the uh, sensitivity uh, of them when they are. Now, think about this. There are 220 implants that can be put in the human body. And I must say, I've been guilty of doing a lot of them uh, because we had heart valves and synthetic grafts for aortas and, and things like that, okay? But the big one are the teeth. And the uh, uh, old amalgam fillings full of mercury and full of metal, uh, the acrylics, uh, methyl methacrylate, uh, and acrylic uh, fillings, so the composites, in other words, can do it. And... Uh, the only ones that don't seem to be uh, or seem to be fairly safe are the porcelain. And uh, uh, so you do it. Now, here's the other thing about implants. People got hips, knees, and so on. Implants make our uh, antennas. And as Professor Blank uh, talked about these antennas, here's an artificial set of antennas that uh, get the people. Now we're getting the uh, combination of not only the metal, but also of the uh, different uh, uh, pulses, like a pacemaker, which has to put out certain frequencies to make the heart beat uh, uh, normally. Uh, some of the heart valves uh, are made out of uh, metal and the like. And then there's the, now the new defibrillators that you can implant. And of course, they put out a few different frequencies also uh, when they get the jaw. IV ports for, mal for malnutrition, a large segment of the population now uses these uh, to get well with, but they also act as antennas. Now, we also have all these hernia repairs or slings for pelvises or you name it for defects. And they're uh, either metal mesh or Dacron, Teflon, nylon, polyethylene, vinyl, polycarbonate, silicone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we're now to the point where if a chemically sensitive patient is, uh, or electrically sensitive, either one, has to have an implant, we always test them beforehand because some are sensitive to some materials and not others, and sometimes you can neutralize these things also. So uh, that's the uh, kind of uh, uh, thing that we have uh, realized in the present. There are uh, lens implants, there are three lens implants, and so we always test our patients for those if they have to have their cataracts replaced because uh, we wouldn't want anybody going blind uh, from uh, the uh, uh, reaction of the chemical or electromagnetics to the n human uh, tissue. So uh, as you can see, there's a whole broad field there that nobody ever dreamed of before uh, you know, just uh, uh, of implants. Saved a lot of people's lives, made a lot of people very comfortable, but on the other hand, it uh, um, has problems in some people. And of course, uh, one of the worst ones that we see are the unnecessary implants, like the uh, silicone breast implants and the saline breast implants. We've taken hundreds and hundreds of those out of people to decrease their total load so their sensitivity uh, goes down. The other big thing is pesticides. The pesticides appear to be an issue, initiator in about 80% of the patients we see. And uh, the, the so-called safe uh, uh, pesticide they've switched to now is the pyrethrum. Well, there are not enough chrysanthemums in the world, and especially the United States, to cause pyrethrum pesticides, so most of it is piperona butoxide, which is a very toxic chemical, and uh, so you have to uh, uh, watch uh, those things. And uh, if we can just get everybody to ask what caused it when you get sick, people are starting now to get their idea that they can help tell what it is, okay? Cause and effect, cause and effect. Well, you know, why'd you start going downhill at X time, you know? What were you doing? What were you eating? What were you working around? And what was in your home? Did you have it sprayed? Did you have uh, gas heat that might have leaked? Uh, did you have solvents in there? Did you put a new carpet in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Did the Wi-Fi 
uh, come in and is there a new uh, uh, bunch of cables around you or whatever. And it gets more complicated all the time, but it certainly does exist. Okay, so in addition to the food chemical sensitivity, um, the uh, you can measure things now in the patient's uh, breath, their blood, their hair, and their union, urine, and you can figure out some of the different uh, areas that might be causative or increasing to the total body load. For example, this is a whole blood analysis of a uh, patient who was electrically sensitive. And uh, as you can see, they had benzene, ethylbenzene, styrene, toluene, xylene uh, in them. But they here were, was hexane and 2 and 3 methylpentane that were really uh, quite uh, large in there. And this patient uh, particularly uh, uh, that had uh, been exposed to a lot of petrochemicals, but at that time uh, she'd been eating a lot of oils because they knew oil was good for her, and of course the oil was extracted with hexane. And uh, so contamination of the food uh, there uh, triggered off uh, not only the chemical sensitivity, but the electrical sensitivity. Now this is an example of a breath analysis, which we, now we can do for a thousand chemicals. And uh, look at here, number one, in this uh, patient, uh, quite high propensity uh, was uh, the uh, part of the uh, pyrethrum pesticides. And the second one is uh, isobutene, which is part of natural gas. So you squirt a little pesticide in the house and, and a little natural gas leak uh, from your furnace and you got yourself a, a real problem in there, you see. And so you can just go down on here's hexane and heptane again, several hexanes, and so on down the line. Even got some octane in her, but she didn't really feel like she had her octane in her tank. <laughs> All right. So in this section, clearly EMF sensitivity exists mm -hmm. and can be considered in the history when diagnosing uh, chemically sensitive and food sensitive patients. Now. There are many techniques available for the diagnosis of this, and uh, the question is, how do you treat it? What are you going to do? Now, this slide is made uh, a couple of years ago, so it's maybe out of date now because of the fact you try to get people into areas of the country that's less polluted and less polluted electrically, and I don't even know whether we can say that anymore. All I can say is that these are areas that were less polluted uh, at one time shortly, short time ago. Now, this happened to be in a point in Nova Scotia, which was right on the ocean and seemed to be quite clear uh, yet, but you get the radio waves coming in. And this was an area in West Texas where there's just miles and miles and miles and miles and nothing, ranch land, and uh, people have done well there. I had one patient who was so severe electrically that she couldn't tolerate civilization, and she had to move out to a, a cave house in a canyon, and she cleared there. And, and I said, well, what are the complications besides being isolated? Well, she said, there's only one thing. Every time a satellite goes over and I'm outside, I get zapped. So there are things that you never think of until people uh, find them out, and the human guinea pig uh, gives you that uh, help, you know. And here's a point in St. John's and the Virgin Islands where one patient got, well, way out in almost the middle of nowhere. And however, as uh, years went by, she started noticing that in May she would have problems and it would go to September. Does anybody know what that would be? Pardon, tourist season. No, no, that wasn't it. Could be, though, couldn't it? <laughs> African dust. <laughs> and African dust comes over from uh, May to uh, September into the North American continent. The rest of the time, it goes to fertilize the Amazon. And uh, the things that are in African dust are just legion, including a lot of metals, chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, city pollution, you name it. You know, So it's something you have to consider uh, when uh, you see people like this who are really uh, uh, struggling or who just get ill uh, from these things. And this is another area 
uh, that's uh, pretty good yet. Okay. You, in other words, you like areas where it's difficult to pick up Wi-Fi, television, et cetera, which is, as you know, we're being great uh, companies that we have in this country, they're good. They can go almost go into anywhere and, and zap anybody this day and age. So it's something to consider. Now, the other thing is uh, areas where grounding is uh, feasible. Now, I want to take a survey in here. How many people wear leather-soled shoes? Raise your hand. Uh, unbelievable, isn't it? So therefore, you stop your grounding right away, don't you? If you don't have leather-soled shoes, you can't ground. The electrical impulses come right back to you, you know? And so uh, one of the things we like to do, of course, is uh, since we're from Texas anyway, you know, we believe in all that rawhide stuff, uh, have people wear electrically or leather-soled shoes, good old cowboy boots or whatever, okay? So, uh, so something for you all to think about on this one. It's a, probably a good idea because every step you take and every place you place your feet, you have a potential to ground, but sometimes you can't do it, you know? If you get that rubber, uh, just circ circulates right back up into you, okay? Now the other thing is is a grounding outside uh, where you would uh, take uh, and put cables in outside your uh, house windows and and uh, string them from your bed or string them from whatever you're doing. And uh, what we've learned on that is you really got to be careful of how far you drive down. And we have some people that. Uh, I know several people that six feet, if they don't have their ground rod in their area at six feet, if they have it less than that or more than that, it won't ground. And and you'll get electricity flowing the other way. I had one patient who uh, was out in rural Texas and she, uh, we got the electric company out and turned off the ground, uh, turned off electricity in her house because she was so miserable. And uh, it was about a quarter mile from the old country road and it was uh, about a quarter mile from the Brazos River, and the, where she would go for relief would be, she could stand just till she was knee high in water, and she would get total relief for electrical sensitivity. And uh, we measured uh, after the electric uh, electricity was off at the road, we had a, a giant uh, uh, ground from the pole uh, that had just gone to her house, so we knew it wasn't coming from there, and it was hot as a firecracker. And uh, what we, the best thing we could postulate, since it was a rural Texas, was that uh, there was an iron vein gone there. There was a railroad track a mile away, and it recirculated and threw the electrical line to that. So uh, there are some real screwy problems that you have to work out on some of these patients, you know, uh, to do that. Uh, the other thing was that Fort Hood, one of the biggest military bases in the world, was five miles from her. And of course, Lord knows uh, what was going on there. You know, that was the uh, un, un thing. But the fact that she could clear in the river would suggest to you it was a local problem. Okay. Now, um, inside, you know, the use of wood obviously is uh, uh, good for not not uh, triggering the EMF. Uh, but the one thing you have to worry about on that is the conifer woods like pine and cedar and uh, those type families uh, have put out high doses of terpene 24-7. And so those will disturb a lot of people and can accentuate your electrical sensitivity. So you like to use hardwoods if you can, hardwood floors and uh, so on. Uh, of course, the computers and uh, television and everything, if you have it off the ground and shield it, it'll help. Uh, the other thing is uh, wires, uh, like, it seems like the twisted wires, the three wires, will negate a lot of the EMF. And uh, so if you can do that when you're constructing a house, I think this may help quite a bit. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, most of the uh, older houses have wires just going along one wall. And it always seems like uh, you have to have the plugs and the lights and everything and put your head of your bed up against the uh, wires uh, that are in that particular wall. And so sometimes you can uh, take people and put their bed in the middle of the room and if there's nothing running underneath it, 
uh, that'll make a big difference for uh, some people. Um, ceramic floors also uh, work quite well, and ceramic walls, so we have some rooms that are all ceramic, and they work very well. Uh, wood, be wood bedding uh, without metal on it will help, uh, and we like to use pure cotton and silk for the bedding, and then our old rawhide set of springs. This is not what to do. This is, happens to be one of our uh, uh, buildings at the Marriott where we built uh, uh, 22 beds for environmental control. And of course, uh, at the time, we weren't smart enough to not use metal, but we did use glass and ceramic floors. And I've been surprised about 90% uh, of the uh, environmentally electrically sensitive people can go in there and do quite well. Uh, but a, a few can't because of the metal. And the same with the bedding, you need to ground that if you're going to use that uh, in there. So uh, this is one that's a non-shielded uh, uh, TV, which doesn't work for the electrically sensitive people. The other thing we've noticed is there are three types of water that are safe. Uh, the most polluted type is the uh, distilled water. And of course, you have to have uh, no plastic parts in it. Uh, number two is the filtered water, uh, which is, uh, you've got to be double filtered anyway, house filter and water, uh, drinking water filter. Uh, the last one should be ceramic and uh, steel. And then finally, uh, the last type is the spring waters. Seems the best one we've tested in the world has been Mountain Valley from Hot Springs, Arkansas, in glass bottles, not plastic. Avion from France seems to be number two. And uh, then there's a whole line of spring waters down, but you gotta be sure they're in glass because otherwise you get too much uh, um, plastic phthalates and so on. Organic foods uh, quite helps these people with a variety of uh, diets. And here's some of these uh, spring waters and this is one of the ceramic filters, but that's not enough. It has to be double filtered with that. And one of the distillers here, it's all metal. Now, the other thing that's been quite efficacious, and nobody seems to talk about this much, except our group of physicians who are into this, and that's neutralization uh, of the EMF through two ways. Number one, nonspecific neurotransmitters, um, uh, taking the food and chemical and mold problem uh, and neutralizing that, and then neutralizing the metals. And people can take drops under their tongue if they need it, or get shots by themselves that they can take every four days. And this is extreme, this has been extremely efficacious. And for those people who have severe pain all the time from the EMF, a lot of times you can stop this cold with either the neutralizing dose of histamine or serotonin or capsation. Does anybody know where capsation comes from? Well, capsation is the prime ingredient of hot red chili peppers. And it just happens to be as part of the nerve conduction in the body. And there are two types of nerves. There's a small a myelinated type nerve, which is the A delta fibers, which gives you sharp pain. And then the other one is the, uh, um, C fibers, and they, these are unmyelinated, no cover in their sheath, and they give you the burning pain. And so a lot of times you can stop these really well with that, and it's so nice not to have a drug, trying to get a drug to work on these people, you know. So uh, we like to do these provocation and neutralizations for that. And uh, the other problem is now chemically sensitive, or. EMF sensitive patients, some of them are so fragile that they can't be neutralized. And uh, I think that the problem is, is that uh, uh, their, their molecules are so unstable in their body and their nerves and their blood vessels uh, that they just can't hold any good point that's safe for them. But on the other hand, we uh, uh, know uh, that you can uh, uh, do some things for these patients and have them uh, have it work. So uh, nutrition is always very important in giving resistance to these people, and uh, particularly 
Oh, you can do it uh, orally, but sometimes you have to give it intravenously or by injections. And uh, I have a woman who just came in from New Zealand. She says she's going to come every six months because the socialized system in New Zealand won't allow her to get methylcobalamin, which is a type of B12 that we have in this country, and she can't even get it there. And uh, that the uh, authorities confiscate it uh, when it comes in, and uh, yet it was crucial to her survival. And that she went back to work, her brain cleared, good energy and everything. As long as a simple thing like that, you know? And it's just totally ridiculous. And uh, of course, we're all afraid that this is going to happen uh, in this country if uh, the feds get control of the medicine, you see. Because they, you know, everybody knows more than we do about our individual patients. So that's uh, uh, one example of that that uh, you have to take care of, okay? Also the multivitamins, lipids, and oils. And then this is a whole regimen of what we might give somebody orally who was sensitive to EMF, the vitamin C, about 6,000 milligrams daily, B vitamins, 100 milligrams, B12,000, folic milligram, a couple times a week, vitamin D, sunshine if you can, but some parts of these countries you don't seem to get much of it, so you can supplement it then uh, with around um, oh, 2,000, 3,000 units a day. Vitamin E, uh, 400 to 1,200, and vitamin A, of course, uh, if you're out in the sun for an hour, you get at least 50,000 units of vitamin D. So these are some of the things that one can do for the chemical sensor, and then you got to supplement them with the minerals, and uh, the big one, the most important one, in my opinion, is the magnesium. Magnesium seems to be crucial to running the body and the cell membranes and having something to do with electrical uh, impulses, and so uh, that you uh, uh, want to keep in mind all the time. Now, we've also noticed that what happens is, is that when an EMF cell gets uh, zapped, uh, the pH drops. And when the pH drops, it changes the membranes of the cells. And so there's a big bunch of sodium and potassium staying outside the cells. And they influx in for pH of about 6.5 to 7. And then if the insult keeps on going, it opens up the cell membranes higher, or bigger, I should say, allows calcium to go in, and the calcium co can go right to the energy producers, the mitochondria, and the patient gets weak and fatigued. And of course, you see this over and over again with the electromagnetic uh, sensitivity, something that's uh, really totally preventable. Well, what happens when that, those get cells get swollen? The microcirculation, is, this is not the circulation that comes across your lungs. That's okay. That goes to the tissue, but the one that ta takes the oxygen out of the tissue is the important one. And if you uh, get it, it's only one cell membrane big, it's four millimeters. So you get one cell swollen and bang, that part of the microcirculation cuts off. And when that happens, bang, you uh, lose oxygen at that point, the pH drops more and the energy goes down, okay? so. Uh, uh, it's a vicious uh, cycle, and sometimes you can break this with oxygen therapy uh, two hours a day, four to eight liters for about uh, 18 days. Sometimes you have to go 36 or 72, depending on how sick the patient is. Then occasionally hyperbaric oxygen helps these people also. And this is uh, uh, one with, uh, with the uh, oxygen therapy with the ceramic mask, cellophane bags, not plastic, in the old grungy oxygen tanks, we uh, the company always likes to paint them. So we had to have them uh, stop painting the tanks because uh, people were reacting to the paint and uh, negating the therapy. You know. And here's the cellophane and glass bottles for the uh, uh, water for moisturizer. Um, the other thing is there are some immune modulators that will help uh, the uh, uh, EMF sensitive patient, and one is gamma globulin, and it's readily available in every physician's office, and yet no, very few measure it, and particularly the subsets, 
and there's a whole group of patients that get a couple of shots of gamma globulin for a month or two, and all of a sudden, their body starts regulating again, and you can throw them back into a state of wellness. The other thing is uh, we've developed in our center uh, T lymph sites uh, decrease in a lot of patients, and you can actually take their own blood, grow it in culture for six weeks, and get strong T lymphocytes and give it back to them, and they do well. We've done about 3,000 patients over the last 30 years that way, and with quite, uh, it was quite successful. And the other thing is we use uh, uh, energy work. Uh, we use two things, which is nice. One is uh, we have one girl who is, uh, works with all the professional athletes across the country, and she's super at electrical massage, and they just shoot a small amount of electricity in them. You think that can't happen in a in a uh, electrically sensitive individual, but you can, and uh, she can relieve them. The second thing is the energy manipulator, the the person who can see uh, uh, see aura and see energy, and she can smooth it out. It's probably the best one I've ever seen in the world that uh, can do that. Sauna. 50% of the patients have problems with the sauna. So electrically sensitive, what we do is we put these people, most of these people can't sweat, and therefore they get a cell cycle of getting worse. And uh, so we use a hardwood sauna uh, with uh, that, and we heat it up and then turn off all the electricity in it. And, and so they don't get zapped from the electrical heated sauna, you see. And then that way you can uh, go ahead and get them in there for 20 or 30 minutes, and uh, then they seem to do quite well. And so the infrared you can't use usually on electrically sensitive people. And this is the ceramic sauna uh, that also works quite well with it. So in summary, EMF sensitivity can be diagnosed and treated in many cases, improve it about 85% of the people with uh, um, with the problem. I'm going to stop there and see if we got any questions or anything then. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the bed should be put in the middle of the room. I have tremendous trouble with uh, uh, my clients in geopathic stress and underground water veins. So I can't randomly put the bed anywhere until I check that out. I, I said I would agree with that. Uh, and of course, doesn't it also depend on whether it's first floor or second floor? Pardon, any floor? Okay, uh, you're right. Do you treat people with Lyme disease? Because recently, people near where I live a lot have also re, um, responding to mold that interacts apparently with Lyme as well as EMFs. Do you deal with that? I've seen a lot of my patients as uh, clients as well that seem to have Lyme, Lyme and chemical sensitivity. Like there must be some association. Lyme is the big rage right now, next to the uh, uh, smart meter, and uh, what we we get all the Lyme failures, of course, and uh, after they've had antibiotics for two years and still uh, can't get well, uh, then you have to look into all these uh, other things we were just talking about, because it will mess up the immune system. The question is why they get Lyme in the first place, and. Uh, you can't tell me that all these people across this country got uh, uh, bitten by a tick, you know? There's just a great many that haven't, and the question is, how, why did they get it? Well, probably they had a sensory nerve system that was damaged and an immune system was damaged, and there was some other cause for it, and a lot of times you have to look for those causes, you see. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Uh, Dr. Ray, through our nonprofit organization in Canada, we have uh, been contacted by about 60 medical doctors, and some of them are extremely electrosensitive. 
but none of them will come out of the closet, so to speak, and unite as a body like the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. Do you have some suggestions as how we could kind of unite the physicians? If you got that many, why don't you uh, um, have them join the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, which we have a large Canadian contingent. Uh, um, we have several academics in Canada, and uh, they certainly could uh, fit right in with them, you know, and because uh, uh, they've been going for years. See, one of our founders was John McLennan, uh, who was, I guess he was from Hamilton, and he's dead now, but uh, uh, so they've had a strong group, <clears throat> and they just use it as a, as a part of our organization, and they're just part of it, you know. In fact, one of our past presidents was just uh, uh, from Canada. But, pardon? Jennifer Armstrong, that's right, who was a patient, a chemically sensitive patient, too, you see. And uh, uh, I think Lynn Marshall was the president, too. What's that, University of Western Ontario or Western? She's out of the uh, University of Toronto. The University of Toronto, yeah. So the, there's, a, there's a good group up there that could help them, and maybe they can get them come out of the closet and not be afraid. Look, I mean, you know, electricity has been in medicine for almost for. 100, 200 years, you know, it's been used. I mean, we've shocked hearts and we've uh, shocked muscles and, and done all kind of things uh, with it. And so it's just a logical extension of, it's not weird or wonderful or anything. It's just part of the, part of the game of learning good physiology, you know? And I know they had good physiologists in Canada. So the guys aren't thinking quite right. I guess they're afraid because they're not doing, doing, one person's line of thinking, in my opinion. Dr. Lynn Marshall from uh, University of Toronto. She runs in, she's part of the Environmental Health Clinic at yeah. Women's College Hospital. And they've been operating since 1988, and they just had their funding cut it yet again. So it is a challenge. Uh, so I'll take two more questions, and then we'll move along. Thank you. Uh, part of what I gleaned from your presentation is that the patients that come to visit you stay there for a certain period of time, weeks, perhaps a month or two, and I suspect that they do not stay in the clinic. So that what I also am gleaning is that you're trying to make sure that the clinic is clean as much possible, chemically, electrically, and what have you. But you also mentioned that there's a Marriott next door, which I also kind of gleaned is where the clients, patients stay. Do you know that the Marriott is trying to mimic the efforts that you are doing in the clinic of being minimally chemical, minimally electrical, magnetic, and so on, such that when they leave the clinic at the end of the day and they go to sleep, they also have a quiet environment? Well, this is an interesting phenomenon. We lease uh, one building in the Marriott where we have 22 beds, okay, where people can stay. As of yet, which has probably been eight or ten years now, I used to have this unit in the hospital, and so we thought we'd try it as outpatient. Uh, I haven't noticed one change in the, Mar the other sides of the Marriott. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, they seem to be slow learners, I think. I, w I would have hoped that you, we could have gotten the whole chain to, to do this across the country, and it seemed to me like it would be a good business gimmick, and obviously we're always too premature. Maybe it'll come. Who knows? Thank you. One last question in the back. We'll pass the mic through to you. How's that? Thank you. Um, it's kind of twofold. One goes back to the um, synthetic material or the metals, actually, like for implants. Um, titanium, is that um, one that needs to be um, of concern with titanium screws, titanium plates, things like that. And then also, um, if we don't happen to live in your area, how do we find a doctor that um, is on the cutting edge of this type of information so that when you go to get tested, they don't look at you like you have a third eye? So to speak. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Excellent two questions and excellent one to finish off. 
American Academy of Environmental Medicine has a directory of physicians in the, mostly in Canada and America, and you can call them and see if they do it. Some of them don't do the neutralization techniques. Uh, I'd say the majority do. And uh, so if they can't test for materials, then they usually call us and decide what to, what to do. But uh, this implant thing is a massive problem now. We have tons of people sensitive to titanium, titanium alloy, and it's just uh, anybody that's got an implant in, we just routinely test them uh, for it. And the majority of them that can get their implants removed, they do, but there are some you can't. You know, you have to have them in. And so what we do is give the injection neutralization, and usually that works uh, most of the time. So uh, it's a multifaceted uh, type treatment that you've got to give in those patients. They're at a handicap. Anybody's got to implant in, even though they're just doing great. Uh, well, yeah, some of them had it in the brain, sure. They, it's called, yeah. And, you know, they're all kind of... Uh, well, you know, like the coronary uh, stents, and, and there are brain stents and drainage uh, from those, and you have to get the materials, and then and you can work it out, because some of those can't come out, you know, and uh, uh, the like. So we're constantly dealing with that. Fortunately, you know, I, uh, in my former life, put in a lot of those things, so I, I do have a little bit of understanding of them. Dr. Ray, on behalf of everyone here today, absolutely immensely grateful for your time and your expertise and your pioneering passion to actually make people healthy. It is an absolute inspiration. Thank you kindly.